today on an all-new Dr. Phil. He says when his girlfriend's mom went to heaven. Their relationship went to hell. This isn't love. I'm done. I'm tired of this. One of us is going to end up in jail. There's one thing you said that set off every alarm bell in my head. Plus, the wife of a pro fighter who lied to Dr. Phil. She says she is finally ready to tell the truth about her husband's abuse. Let's do it. Not a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Melissa wrote in to me saying that her life has been on a downward spiral since her mother died suddenly last year. Now, her boyfriend Dave says she's gone from leaving love notes in his lunchbox to biting his head off when he asked for a cup of coffee. She still cries daily, has panic attacks, and literally pulls her hair out. He said when Melissa's mom went to heaven, their relationship went to hell. Take a look. I have been on a downward spiral since my mom's death. She died in April of 2016. The reason I am the way that I am is because yes. of my mom's passing. She had a lot of respiratory issues. It was very sudden. Since my mom's death, my relationship with Dave has been impacted the most. Our fights have gotten out of control. Open your eyes. We do argue daily. It can turn into a full-on screaming match. It can last for a couple days. He has a loud voice. He doesn't hold back at all. I opened my mouth to Melissa. If I want to talk to my girlfriend about something she did to me. Once he starts raising his voice, then I start getting my anxiety attacks. I feel like I'm losing my mind. I'll call him and ask, Dick. It's gotten so bad where we feel like if something doesn't get done, one of us is going to end up in jail. Jail or hurt. He will call me a bitch. He's called me a... You're the one who just said it, Johnny. I have thrown a few picture frames. I have ripped my necklace off of me and threw it at him. My son is afraid of Dave. I am here to be a better mother to my boys. Why don't you show me you actually love me? Because this isn't love. This is abuse. He says that I'm using my mom's death as an excuse for me treating him the way that I'm treating him. I'm done! I'm, I'm done! I'm tired of this! Yeah, me too. If things don't improve, we're going to have to go our separate ways. Well, Dave says he wants the old Melissa back. It's ruining their relationship. So listen to this. Melissa's behavior has changed dramatically since her mom has passed away. Melissa went from like sweet, sensitive girl, I'd like leave little love notes, she would, you know, get my lunches together. Now it's like, I'd be lucky if I get her to do anything, I mean, without a fight. She has become insecure, depressed, her anxiety has spiked. It's out of this world. When I'm at home, it's always like walking on eight shows with her. I don't give a about anything anymore. I'm tired of your she becomes angry and she throws things across the room. I absolutely do love her. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't be here. I think any other man would have left. She's too focused on her mother's death. I wish Melissa would grieve. She hasn't grieved. I could definitely yell. I'm allowed to have those feelings. Yes, but, you but I'm also allowed to try to make sense of how something like that happened. When I get excited, I think Melissa focuses on the level of my voice instead of what is actually the problem. I get angry because my gets disrespected. She will not let things go. She does continue the arguments. Absolutely, I would love to have more sex than what we are having now. You want to have sex, and then next day, you're arguing with me. Wonder then you want to have sex again. About three months ago, I was going to propose to her. I was shopping for rings, but I am not happy, and I have told her that. If Melissa doesn't get help with her depression and her anxiety, the fights will continue and they will get worse. Our relationship will end. I can guarantee you that. 
Okay, you're saying that this is all happening because your, your mother has died. I'm sorry for your loss, by the way. That's very hard. Thank you. My mother was my best friend. Mm -hmm. She was my backbone. And when she died, I died with her. To this day, it kills me because I, I literally seen her take her last breath. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, when, when you saw that, what did you say to yourself? Whiteboard. That I don't know how I'm gonna live anymore. What you said, and I, I'm gonna write it down. You said, I died with her, right? And you said when you saw her take her last breath, it killed me. You also said she was my backbone, right? Yeah. Okay. So when, when you realized she was dead, what, what, what did you say to yourself? She's gone. I mean, I, I've, I've buried both of my parents, and... Uh, well, we think we're ready, right? But then the finality of it is overwhelming, isn't it? Very. I don't think it hit me right away until... No, no, that's what I mean. The finality of it is like, you think you're ready for it. Have you lost a loved one yet? Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, you, think you, you think you're ready for it, and then when you realize there's no do-overs, there's no timeout, King's X, wait a minute... Yeah. Hold on, there's no negotiating. <laughs> it's yeah, just, right. just done. Mm -hmm. That's like overwhelming, isn't it? It is. And so when it hits you, what, what, did, what did you say to yourself? I just told myself I don't know how I'm going to get through my days anymore. I literally felt like I lost myself too. See, I'm doing this for a reason. Um, Do you believe yourself? I mean, if, if, you, if you come up to a stoplight and, you, and, it's, and it's green and you tell yourself, it's green, I can go, do you believe yourself? Mm -hmm. that, that's how we navigate through life. You tend to believe yourself, raise your hand. You believe, what say, say yourself? Okay. So, you say, she was my backbone, so now you don't have one. I died with her, so now you're dead. Your life is over. It killed me. Once again, you're dead. Your life is over. I lost myself. You're gone. You're no longer part of this equation. So you have zero backbone. You're dead, dead, and gone. So I don't ask myself why you're absent behaving this way, I ask myself, why not? You're programming yourself at 10 speed. So maybe we need to change your internal dialogue. Yeah. And you have children? Yeah, I have two boys. How old? 14 and eight. So their mother's dead. <coughs> you don't. died with your mother. Yeah. They don't have, I'm not the same mom that I used to be with them. And it's very upsetting to me. Yeah. Coming up, Melissa says she and Dave's screaming matches have become so hateful that they're leaving lasting marks. They say some things that, yeah, kind of hard to get over. We're going to find out what that is when we come back. And later, one of my former guests who defended her abusive UFC fighter husband is going to join us. We're going to find out why she says she was too good of a liar. We'll be right back. Why her? Why? Should it have been her mother instead? No. There's one thing you said that set off every alarm in my head above all else. And later, a former guest returns to set the record straight. She doesn't want you to hear the truth. No, 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 no. Speak the truth is, she has a problem. I've got two ears, one for Be you. Be quiet, now. 
I have said things that are unforgivable. I've told Dave many times that I hate him, that he's made my life worse. Me, grow the You are the biggest I have ever met. The one thing that I will never get out of my head, he goes, you wonder why everybody in your life leaves you. You wonder why your ex-husband cheated on you. You wonder why your biological dad has been out of your life. Those are very personal things that hurt me, things that I will never get out of my head. Wow. Do you do that? I've done that. What's yeah. your What's your objective at the time? I didn't have one. I was just, I was just angry. I regret it to this day. And you, I'll you, regret it till I die. Were you just try, at the time, you are just trying to inflict pain? I wasn't trying to inflict pain. I, I, you know, I guess I was just trying to open her eyes. Like, just you, just like nothing, nothing works. Like nothing, <clears throat> you know. I try to say to her, do for her. I mean, it, it, nothing works. Like, and I, I don't know. It, it, it was stupid. It's been a year and a half since your mom passed. Yeah. Um, does that seem reasonable? Mm -hmm. That you're where you are now at a year and a half? I feel lost. I don't feel like myself anymore. I just. Is it all pain or are you angry? Are you confused? Are you scared? What, 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 do, you, what do you feel? You, you say he doesn't understand and he doesn't listen. I, I want to. I want you to tell me how you feel. I feel a lot of pain. And it was, you know, her, her death wasn't something that was expected. It was very unexpected. Nobody, nobody knew that it was going to happen. And, you know, it is, I literally feel like I'm lost. I'm, I'm hurt. I'm, I'm confused. To like, why? Why her? Why? You, stand up. Yes. Should it have been her mother instead? No. How about you, stand up. Should it have been her mother instead? No. You, stand up. Should it have been her mother instead? No. That's her mother sitting next to her right there. Should it have been, should it have been her that died instead? Who do, who do you want to take your place? No one. I don't want anybody to feel this way. Well, I understand, but I mean, it's a cycle of life. People are born and people die. And you said, why her? Do you want it to be her mother or her mother or her mother instead of your mother? No. Then what, you, you want no one to ever die? I, I wish it could be like that, but I don't, I don't know. It's going to get really crowded. <laughs> If, if nobody dies, it's going to get really crowded. You know, that's the cycle of life. I mean, people, people die, and I mean, that's hard for me to say because I'm like next up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, my generation, we're the next ones to uh, do it. So, but I mean, it's the cycle of life, right? Yeah. Um, but you're not, you don't really want to get over this yet, right? Because you're still, you, you, do you think if, if you decide to get past this that you're letting her go? Um, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, Well, you're hanging on for some reason. It's a year and a half, and a year and a half, if you're still getting worse, that's not grief, that's depression. And everybody grieves differently. Some people do it fast, some people do it slow. But if it's a year and a half, you're saying to yourself one thing that out of everything, I, I got a notebook that was 262 pages long. There's one thing you said that set off every alarm, every bell in my head above all else. 
I'm going to tell you what it is after the break. Look her in the eye and tell her what you miss. The sweet things you used to do. I just missed your love. Your love's not there anymore. That's the hardest part. Three months ago, Dave and I were having a really bad argument. I was having a very bad panic attack. I went over to my nightstand and grabbed my bottle of Xanax pills, and I put them all in my mouth. It was one swallow away from me hurting myself. I did spit them out. I hate myself to this day for doing that. I don't want to end my life. Yes, I wanted to show Dave how much pain I was in. Why did you fall in love with her to start with? loving and caring and I mean, she, I mean as you can tell she's gorgeous I mean tell her what you miss about her look at her look her in the eye and tell her what you miss it's the old you the, look her in the eye you're not looking at her the sweet things you used to do the, I just miss your love I just know it's not there that's the hardest part. Your love's not there anymore. It's there. I just don't know how to show it like I used to. Do you want to know what the one thing was that she said to me that set off every alarm and bell in my head? She said, I've become a burden. They would be better off without me. No. I guess I didn't hear that. No, absolutely not. We need you every day. I've become a burden. They're better off without me. It's the no. number one predictor of suicide. No, you're not a burden, and, and nor will you ever. You know that. Let me ask the obvious question. Do you think your mother wants her legacy to be one of pain? that every time you think of her, you burst into tears. That every time she comes into your mind or spirit, that it's a source of pain. And that for the rest of your life, you are a broken spirit. Do you think that that's what she wants her legacy to be? Not at all. Read what's written on that side. Read it out loud to me. The depth, breadth, and longevity of your grief are not a reflection of how much you cared about the person. You believe that? I want you to set aside maybe an hour a day. Maybe it's first thing in the morning, get up before everybody else. Or maybe it's in the afternoon, kids are at school, everybody's gone, you're there. Maybe it's at night when you're alone. Set aside an hour. And during that hour, you can focus totally on your relationship with your mother. Maybe you take that time to journal and write down your thoughts. Maybe you take the time to talk to her. But you compartmentalize it. And you don't have to think about it the other 23 hours of the day. You don't have to feel about it the other 23 hours of the day because you know I've got an appointment with her and with this that hour a day and I'm going to keep it and we're going to talk about this during that hour a day. Compartmentalize it. Make that appointment and keep it. And write it down. And you will notice like painting a black wall white, you will notice progress as you go across there. But you have to commit to the progress and consider it success when you move across there. Not betrayal, but success. Because at the other end of that wall, you're going to meet your mother. And she's going to say, well done. Sounds good. Deal? Deal. Okay? Oh, yeah. Perfect. Right. We're going to get some help with this, all right? Okay. All right, I'm going to let these guys go with, uh, with that thought in mind. Uh, we've been speaking about how loss uh, isn't just an end. It can be a beginning, too. Our next guest is learning to begin again 
after years of physical and mental abuse. We'll meet her next. The former UFC fighter arrested twice for allegedly beating his wife and sticking his dog on her. Has he threatened to kill you? Yeah, but like, you know, I have said those things too. You do consider yourself to be in a domestic violence situation, correct? These are just arguments that have gotten out of control. She doesn't no. want you to hear the truth. No, 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 no. Speaking I'm listening. Problem. I got two ears, one for be you, quiet. one for her. No. Now. No, I'm Closing provided by... Caitlin has appeared on the show before. She appeared to stand by her UFC pro fighter husband, who's now serving five and a half years for assault and battery against her. Now, she wrote to me recently because she says she is finally ready to tell the truth after trying to lie to me about her husband's abuse when she was here before. Take a look at what happened the last time. My husband, Josh, does not belong in jail. The police are trying to blow on a portion of family fight because Josh is with the UFC. At the age of 17, Caitlin's husband, Josh, was the youngest professional ultimate fighting championship fighter in his state. The former UFC fighter arrested twice over a four day span for allegedly beating his wife and sticking his dog on her. Caitlin says she's planning to stand by her man no matter what. The first times that we started getting physical were actually my fault. I pushed Josh into getting really angry because I would not stop talking. When Josh hit me, I did end up with a black eye and a bloody lip. Caitlin says it's her mom's fault that Josh is in jail. My mom is a meddling, manipulative liar. She stole my kids. I only went to get custody of the children because Caitlin refused to continue her restraining order against Josh. I'm protecting the children. She's still being controlled by Josh, even though that he's behind bars. You don't think he should be in jail? No. He has punched you in the face and in the lip. Yeah, I guess. And you think that he could kill her? He would have killed her that night if no, she had not. Has he threatened to kill you? Yeah, but like, you know, I have too. Like, I have said those things too. Okay, well, let's take a look at some of these text messages. I will choke you unconscious and smash your throat. I'm going to beat you and throw you to Buddy. Come on, that well, just sounds well, crazy. Josh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Did you abuse your wife physically? No. We have pictures here of her split lip, bloody face, black eye, a knot on her head. Who did that to her? I can't really talk about that. I have an open case right now. Did you send her text messages threatening to kill her and crush her throat? I can't comment on that. Caitlin, is there anything you'd like to say to Josh? Love you. <laughs> no, I love you too, babe. You do consider yourself to be in a domestic violence situation, correct? These are just arguments that have gotten out of control. It ain't an everyday thing. It's not, my husband's not controlling. My husband doesn't check my phone. My, do, my husband doesn't stalk me. She doesn't no. want you to hear the truth. No, 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 no. Speaking, I'm I'm problem. Problem. I got two ears, one for be you, quiet. one for her. No. now. No, I'm not gonna be has gone through so much abuse that she can't admit the truth. Uh, Caitlin wants to come back out. I ain't gonna let her bad mouth my whole family. What kind of show would it be without me? I'll get limp along, along somehow. <laughs> well, Caitlin now admits that she was a victim of abuse. Now, she's having a hard time stepping into the ring as a mom and it's causing drama with her own mother now. So let's come current and take a look at what's going on now. When I was on the Dr. Phil show last time, I was pretty sarcastic. I was rude and very mean towards my mom. I regret making myself look like an ass. I was trying to get my husband out of jail for domestic violence. And when I said that he wasn't abusing me, I was lying. I was afraid of him. I also said that my dog didn't attack me, but that wasn't the case. Josh would allow Buddy to attack me. Since Dr. Phil's show, Josh has now been convicted of 28 charges. He got five and a half years jail, and then after jail, he has to do five and a half probation. I've dealt with five years 
of physical abuse from Josh. The abuse happened every week. When Josh was in jail, he then served me with divorce papers. I didn't believe it at first. How was he doing this to me when I stood behind him the whole time? He used to tell me I was his ride or die chick. <laughs> Josh was using me to get him out of jail. I felt duped. Josh is a phony, he's a con artist. He twists things around to make him seem like some sweet, innocent guy. In the end, he's not. I definitely was brainwashed by Josh. I've suffered with post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety. I don't have my kids right now because I don't have a stable home environment. It's been three years since I've been a real mom. Right now, my mom has guardianship of my kids. I need Dr. Phil's help to be able to figure out how to become a mom again. Caitlin, I'm glad you're back. I'm glad to be back too, and I want to first say um, I apologize for the last time I was here. It was very disrespectful. I get you were in a very tough place then. Yes. So yes. I, I appreciate your apology. I accept that. So he's in jail now for five and a half years. Yes. And which gives you some respite. So tell me what's going on as a mother at this point. Um, my mom has my kids um, still and I'm just trying to get back to being a mom. I haven't really been able to be a mom for a long time now. Um, I was a good mom. I don't feel like I am a good mom anymore. No kid should have to see those things. Well, we need to talk about what you need to do to re-engage in a healthy way where you can bring what you need to bring to the situation. Next, we're going to meet Caitlin's mom, who says her daughter needs to step up and be a mom again. They both agree on that. So what are the barriers? What are the obstacles to doing that? There are some, and they're very real. And we need to talk about how to overcome them. We'll be right back. daughter she's been with Josh since she was 13 so she's been brainwashed right now she can't handle being a mom she needs to work on her she has no job she has no car the house is not livable if she tries to come and take the kids I will go to court and get full custody closed captioning provided by I had real fears that um, Josh would end up killing me. I testified for Josh for two days straight and lied on the stand. I said that he didn't abuse me, that it was just arguments. I downplayed the violence. I was really abused physically and mentally. Deep down inside, I did want him to go to jail and pay for what he did to me. Caitlin says she lied on the stand for nothing because now she has no family. Her mother Karen says Caitlin is a lost soul and she's only been degraded and was never told good things by the man she loved. Take a look. When Caitlin was on the show the last time, I was just disgusted the way she talked to the audience. What kind of show would it be without me? The way she talked to me. She's crazy. It really hurt me because that's not the person I raised. Caitlin finally admitted to my husband and myself that she was abused by Josh to a point that she said to me the other day, I'm a lost soul and I don't know how to get better. She's mentally broken. My daughter is very depressed. She will lash out at me. My daughter could be compared to one of the girls from the Manson situation. They're willing to do whatever they have to do for that abuser. She's been with Josh since she was 13, so she's been brainwashed. It's a lot of years of someone manipulating them and controlling them. Right now, she can't handle being a mom. She needs to work on her. She has no job. She has no car. The house is not livable. My daughter now knows that if she tries to come and take the kids in the condition her home is, that I will go to court and get full custody. I'm a 54-year-old woman that is taking care of a four-year-old and a six-year-old. I want to be a grandmother and not the mother. OK, so I'm glad you're here. Thank you for Thank you for having us here. back. Yeah. What do you think is your biggest obstacle right now, mentally, emotionally, to being a parent? Just me always having flashbacks and I guess PTSD. I just feel like I'm just a bad, bad mom. What do you think the biggest obstacles are for her? I think that now that she's actually admitted 
that the abuse did happen, that she can start to heal, but I don't think that she can do it on her own. Robin, you, you work with so many of these women at when Georgia Smiles Foundation supports women's shelters all over the place. What what do these women struggle with in getting back on their feet and finding their self-worth to, to really stand up and claim their place in the world? A lot of times they tell me that they have trouble accepting the fact that they allowed it to happen. And they blame themselves, and of course they shouldn't. They're, they, as you said before, these abusers have a mind control over them. They manipulate them. They have a process that they go through to put them in a position of being abused. They isolate them always. They take everything away from them that allows them to reach out for help. And then therefore they are a victim. So that's the number one, I believe, hurdle that they have to get over is to stop blaming themselves and telling themselves that it's their fault. Yeah, and you say PTSD, and I don't know whether you have a classic PTSD or not. You very well may. In my opinion, you have a debilitating anxiety, and I would expect that you are in avoidant mode. I suspect she's probably not coming around much with the children right. at this point. You're right. It's probably erratic yep. and probably not very long when she's there. That's true. Um, because she doesn't know how to plug in. It makes it seem like she doesn't give a damn. But the fact is, you have a hard time plugging in, right? Yeah. Coming up, my thoughts on what this mother and daughter both need to do to heal this family, particularly for these precious children. We'll be right back. The last time I saw Josh was his trial, June 16, 2017. Josh is asking right now for custody of my kids while in prison and also support for me. Josh is still now trying to control me from jail. I'm dealt with him. There's a very specialized area of psychology that deals with trauma victims victims of, of abuse, whether it's sexual abuse, physical abuse, or whatever. And I, I want to provide you with that kind of help and ongoing uh, therapy. Uh, but to kind of kickstart that, there's a place called Onsite, uh, which is the worldwide leader uh, in very intensive workshops specializing in victims of emotional and physical trauma. Mm -hmm. And this, they deal with the mental health issues that go along with that, such as PTSD and such as the anxiety. And we consider Onsite a trusted source for anyone struggling with trauma. Uh, self-worth, self-esteem, yeah. the, the mental issues. And they're located on a beautiful ranch just outside of Nashville. It, it is a wonderful therapeutic environment. They have a great treatment team there. And I, I'm gonna recommend that you put yourself in the shop for a period of time. And I don't know how long you would be there because they work to criteria. Okay. How's that sound to you? Sounds great to me. Okay, Definitely. fair enough. Coming up, an international matchmaker who's had success in every way but one. Find out what she needs help with next. Closed captioning provided by... You know, we've all heard about websites, dating apps, swiping left and swiping right, but for some, love is still hard to find. But for my next guest, Sherry, she has spent the last 24 years making love her business by building an international dating agency. She says while her business is successful, all of the working and traveling has left little time for herself. And now that she's 61 years old, the signs of aging have shown up and she needs help. And she says she needs it now. Take a look. I'm in the business of helping people find love. I'm the modern day Cupid. I'm the CEO and founder of Elite Connections International, 
a high-end matchmaking agency. We started off with one office. Now we have 12 offices, Beverly Hills, New York, and Miami Beach. And we're opening an office in Paris. So how'd your date go the other night? People putting their love life in my hands can be stressful, but it's very rewarding when I deliver the person that they fall in love with. The dating game absolutely becomes too much about looks. One time I dated this guy and he said, you know, I have a friend that is a plastic surgeon and he could fix those wrinkles around your eyes. It made me a little insecure. Can't you look past that? When I look in the mirror and noticing the lines are getting a little deeper on my face, the lines around my mouth, my neck's done, it's feeling a little loose. I really want to know a way that I can fight these lines and wrinkles on my face neck while running a successful company. Well, Sherry is here with us and also joining you on behalf of number seven is dermatologist Dr. Sonia Batra. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Now, Sherry, you said when an ex-boyfriend suggested plastic surgery, uh, it made you insecure about your looks. Did you think about punching him in the face first or did you just get insecure? Actually, I did. Yeah. Well, I thought I looked pretty good. So yeah. when I, my ex suggested I get plastic surgery, it did, you know, it killed my self-confidence. Yeah. When somebody says something like that to you, you, you got to understand that self-esteem comes from the inside out, right? And you've got to just decide, I have what I've got to work with. I'm going to embrace that. I'm not going to let somebody else, I'm not going to give my power to somebody else. Because if you give your power away, Oh man, they can, people can take you on a roller coaster ride for the rest of your life. So Dr. Bhatra, like Sherry, so many women have that pivotal moment where their age is showing on their face. So as a dermatologist, what do you suggest? It's really hard when you look in the mirror and what you see really just doesn't match how young you feel inside. And I think many of us have that moment. But when I talk to my patients about crafting an anti-aging routine, I think it's really important to think about things that are age appropriate. Because as we age, our skin becomes more dry, it becomes more fragile. So it becomes even more important to pick those products that pack the most punch and are really targeting you at this age. First, take your cleanser. Your skin is not the same as your daughter's, so please don't pick products that are targeted towards oily or acne-prone skin. You need a really gentle product that's going to really replenish your skin and not dehydrate you while it cleanses. Another suggestion is to incorporate a serum into your everyday routine. When you're thinking about your daily moisturizer, think about something that's really hydrating, that has SPF, that's going to protect you from ongoing sun damage. And similarly, when you look at your night, try to pick something that has cell renewal, repair, that's going to really help with the cell turnover. But Sherry, you mentioned in addition to your wrinkles, you're also really interested in having a more firm neck. Yes, and I'm also noticing uneven skin tone and age spots showing up on my face. This is not fun to talk about. <laughs> Well, the, the good news is I already mentioned incorporating a serum into your everyday routine. And number seven recently released one that I think will address many of your concerns. It's called Restore and Renew Face and Neck Serum. And the serum delivers five clinically proven results. It reduces wrinkles, it improves and firms skin tone on the face and neck, and also reduces neck crepiness, which helps you look as young as you feel. The way you use it is a pea-sized amount in the morning and night after cleansing and before your moisturizer. So how does this work? Is crepiness like a medical term? It's sort of something yeah. dermatologists throw yeah. around, but it's where we all start to see that kind of wrinkling and thinning of the skin on the neck. And it's a great question as to how it works, because in addition to the protein strengthening ingredients, Restore and Renew actually has an extra complex of calcium, amino acids, skin ceramides that really help boost epidermal strength and restore that more youthful appearance. So the idea is that these ingredients really target the fragility and the weakness that come in our face and neck as we age. We get this confidence by what we do for ourselves. Do you think this is something that would help your concerns and restore your confidence by saying, okay, I'm doing something for myself? Yes. I think having one product that would take care of everything is something like a busy woman like I needs. I think when people feel helpless, where they feel like there's nothing they can do, as opposed to saying, I'm taking action, I'm doing A, B, C, and D, that's where they get their confidence back, where they feel like they have some control over it. So, I mean, that's a big deal if you're starting to do something for yourself instead of just letting it happen. Yeah, and, and it's really important to take action. And really, to be effective, skincare doesn't have to be expensive. Restore and Renew Face and Neck Serum is available at your local Target for less than $35. Oh, wow. Yeah, but, but number seven wanted to get you started, so they're actually sending you home with a year's supply. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and 
Audience, uh, we love giving gifts to everybody here, so all of you are going home with your own number seven face and mixer. I want to thank all of my guests today, and a special thanks to Dr. Sonia Batra. If you have a story or life situation that you need my help, I'd love to hear from you. Just email me at drphil.com. Tell me all about it. If you want to be part of our studio audience, the tickets are free. Just go to the website, click on Get Tickets, or you can call me at 323-461-PHIL. That's 323-461-7445. My name has numbers. Who knew? Uh, and be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter. We'll see you next time. Sure, good to meet you.